I won't lie to you, it's a very lucrative business. And making people feel good about being green is great. People feel threatened by global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it. And I make them look and feel better. So as a quick summary, um, my company has a whole team of uh, graphic designers, eco-writers, environmentalists, scientists um, that we can use to rebrand your company and make you look very, very green. Uh, so here, we're, uh, we wanted to show you guys what we are the most proud of uh, at Destiny USA. If you can see behind us, it's going to be the future green capital of America, which is just fantastic. And we were able to truly, utterly, just sensory perception-wise, come into this blank palette and manipulate everything that the consumer experiences about this location. So everybody that comes here, we change the image so that people no longer see a huge monolith, overly lavish and expansive mall. People see the green capital of America. You're listening to CJLO 1690 AM in Montreal, and this is The Worlds We Want, a podcast that explores the bright side of climate change, namely the change part. This is Tristan. This is Cheryl, and this is episode 13 for show in 2019. Today's show is something of a continuation of our last show on the social economy. If you haven't heard that one, go ahead and download the show from our website, but you'll certainly be able to follow along if you haven't heard that one yet. As we discovered last time, the difference between the social economy and the idea of sustainable or social entrepreneurship is a controversial one. Yeah, you, uh, again, these are big debates. That was a bit of a caveat presented to us by Dr. Margie Mandel on our last program. We also learned from a guest on our last show, Natural Wagney, that there's an increased interest in starting businesses with a social or environmental mandate. Uh, there are plenty of projects, more and more uh, for-profit projects mm -hmm. have, an, for example, an environmental mm -hmm. impact. So we see uh, circular economy uh, mm -hmm. companies developing uh, food products from surpluses, uh, you see also uh, there's a company called Madame Lovary. I don't know if you've uh, heard. So they, uh, they develop their reusable uh, uh, underwear with a pad for... Okay, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So Ovary, Madame Ovary. Oh Madame my God, Lovary. that's funny. Okay, I get the, the joke yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. This is a for-profit company. Okay. But they, they have a social mission. They have an environmental mission. Mm -hmm. So you can see how already how there's a lot of different words being used here. Sustainable business, social mission, environmental mission, green business. And, and this confusion can be leveraged by people. There are plenty of examples of businesses that simply change something rather superficial in their practices, such as buying recycled paper or the like, and labeling this exercise as green or sustainable. When I worked in real estate development before the LEED standard was a standard in Canada, I would see that some developers would, for example, have a sustainable alternative for the finishes in their giant suburban homes and consider this a green building. Meanwhile, we were building dense multifamily homes adjacent to public transportation that were deconstructible and net zero or new net zero. And consumers who don't have a deep understanding of sustainability could easily be confused by these two offerings, which were so different from one another and yet being called the same thing in principle. Some people call this window dressing approach to environmental sustainability greenwashing. That is, a practice of making an unsubstantiated or misleading claim about the environmental benefits of a product, service, technology, or company practice in an attempt to take advantage of people who are interested in changing their purchasing habits. Greenwashing can make a company appear to be more environmentally friendly than it really is. We have an excellent article in the show notes that explains this more thoroughly. Worse yet is that it's not uncommon to hear people who are new to this idea to make statements like, All business, All business serves a social, social purpose, purpose, therefore... I don't believe, as some do, that all businesses have a social purpose. I think some business models are... Uh... Greed is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Sociopathic, actually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, in their mission. No, I'll no. leave it at that. We all know. We all know which ones they are. Yeah. 
That was Eric Steedman, uh, also a guest on our last show, expressing something some of us feel after spending too much time reading the news. So we're not going to talk about green businesses or sustainable businesses or social businesses in the general sense today. We're going to be really specific. We're going to talk about social entrepreneurship in particular, especially in light of the current media obsession with entrepreneurship more generally. We wanted to be able to sort of point to one definition that might help people understand how to conceptualize the idea of a business or organization that's looking to make real change in the world. All this to say that we're going to start today's show with the definition, and we are getting this definition from the work of Roger Martin and Sally Osberg in their aptly named paper, Social Entrepreneurship, The Case for Definition, which was published back in 2007. The paper starts, Social entrepreneurship is attracting growing amounts of talent, money, and attention. But along with its increasing popularity has come less certainty about what actually a social entrepreneur is and does. As a result, all sorts of activities are now being called social entrepreneurship. Some say that a more inclusive term is all for the good, but the authors argue that it's time for a more rigorous definition. The problem with defining social entrepreneurship goes in two directions. On the one hand, is what we think of as social entrepreneurship actually entrepreneurship? On the second hand, how is it different from conventional entrepreneurship? We're no longer quite fighting the battle for social entrepreneurs as entrepreneurs. And that was something we tried to do in the original article, too, was really anchor social entrepreneurship in entrepreneurship. You know, Jean-Baptiste Say and his, you know, leveraging resources to their highest and best use. That's what social entrepreneurs do. That's what entrepreneurs do. Um, Schumpeter, of course, the, cre- the force of creative destruction. Again, that's equilibrium change. That's what entrepreneurs do. That's what social entrepreneurs do. But we're no longer fighting that battle. We can move on. And so the real challenge today is summoning the body of evidence that tell us what social entrepreneurship is getting done and how it can provide real lessons and impetus for policy and for business to actually track this wave and make the better world that we all know is possible. That was Sally Osberg, author and the former president and CEO of Skull Foundation, which is where we got this audio. This highlights the mismatch between the common usage of the term entrepreneurship and the academic use of the term. This element of disruption or systems change is part and parcel with academic notions of the startup or entrepreneurs, but it's not always present in the common usage of the term, which sometimes includes new business development, even if that new business isn't particularly innovative or simply looks to make incremental or geographic changes to a product or service without changing the system that it operates within. We'll see this distinction as we revisit the Martin and Osberg paper. We see that back in 2007, they are trying to establish boundaries for the term of social entrepreneurship so that the definition isn't so wide as to become essentially meaningless. They do this by comparing existing models of social venture, namely the provision of social services and social activism. It's sort of an unwritten rule in management academia that you have to chart these activities on a graph with four quadrants. The x-axis is related to outcome, ultimately whether an existing system is maintained or improved, or if a new equilibrium is created and sustained. On the y-axis, we have the nature of the action, which can be direct or indirect. You can see this graph in the show notes. According to the authors, social service providers take direct action within an existing system. The goal isn't so much to change the system, but to mobilize whatever resources are currently available within it. That is, the difference between a social entrepreneur and a social service provider isn't the entrepreneurial context or even the personal characteristics of the founders, but related to the outcomes. The authors ask us to consider the case of Andrew Carnegie, imagining that he had built only one library in a specific community, rather than conceiving of the whole public library system that was developed under his guidance. That one library certainly would have been a real resource to that community, but it's the network of public libraries that can create a permanent new equilibrium, one that ensures access to information to almost all citizens. The other form of social venture that acts as a point of comparison is social activism. 
In this case, the social entrepreneur and the activists share similar motives. They'd like to change an unfortunate yet stable equilibrium. Making this change, be it in a direct or indirect manner, takes inspiration, creativity, and courage. However, the social activist looks to create change through indirect action. For example, by influencing others, governments, NGOs, consumers, workers, etc. They influence them to take action. Social entrepreneurs, on the other hand, use direct action. An example they give us in the paper is the uh, Nobel Peace Prize winning Grameen Bank, which provides small loans to the impoverished without requiring collateral. In principle, granting people the previously unavailable leg up they need to get out of poverty. So in its purest form, the successful social entrepreneur takes direct action and generates a new and sustained equilibrium. The authors acknowledge that in the real world, things won't always be this black and white, and accept that there will be some overlap in many cases. This provides us with a little guidance as to the different ways that people are approaching the idea of sustainable or social entrepreneurship itself, because there are so many ways to think about the topic. And as always, we like to complexify seemingly simple ideas by chatting with very bright people. So join us as we go on an adventure learning about entrepreneurship. It just so happened that we were talking about this topic when there was a business competition being held on campus called the Sustainable Business Plan Competition, so we decided to check it out. Thank you, Ms. Fifth course. I talked with the organizers of the competition to see where they were coming from and what they were hoping to accomplish with the competition that day. Hi, I'm Ankit, and uh, I'm an MBA student at JMSB, mm -hmm. and I'm also the president of the John Molson Sustainable Business Group. And uh, we've organized this competition. We call it the Sustainable Business Plan Competition. Uh, this is done in collaboration with HEC and McGill. So we have teams from the top schools in Montreal, uh, HEC, uh, McGill, and JMSB. And uh, what this uh, competition basically is, uh, that uh, in, in collaboration with the Flourishing uh, Business Canvas, <laughs> which is like a sustainability canvas where you can build your own business idea. And uh, the, the participants present this case to, to judges. And the judges are from, again, from McGill and from uh, John Molson School of Business and from the industry. And then you pick the top three who present the case in a better way. And then they get like prices, cash prices. Okay. So we, we intend to promote sustainability through this competition. This is the second time this has been done. So mm -hmm. the first one was last year where yeah. we were participants. Okay. okay and okay. we liked the event so much that this year we are, uh, we are organizing it again. Okay, great. Would you say that this is... Um a uh, common concern with people in the MBA, the issue of sustainability? Yes, like I can speak in general about business schools and this is just my personal opinion, but I feel there's a lot of talk about sustainability, but there are not many implementable, uh, implementable actions that I see. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to, you know, implement sustainability in business context through this case competition. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think would it would take for more implementation to happen? I think if, if uh, students can actually see what uh, how the industry is incorporating sustainability in their business plans mm -hmm. and even in their day-to-day -day operations mm -hmm. that will help students uh, you know uh, vision how sustainability is actually uh, embedded inside the uh, corporations okay. and their operations okay and what are you looking forward to happening today uh, so top three teams we also have like a certificate like investable and a coachable certificate mm -hmm. so any team which wins and if they want to pursue we have uh, the entrepreneurship cell of JMSB, who, who was one of the judges, mm -hmm. and they can, you know, take it forward to the entrepreneurship cell and develop their business idea, which can eventually flourish into a full-fledged company. That was Ankit Kumar, MBA student at Concordia University and one of the organizers of the 2018 Graduate Sustainable Business Plan Competition. We also spoke with this woman. Uh, so my name is uh, Emily Mong. Um, I I came from China. Okay. Uh, I joined uh, MBA uh, McGill uh, from last year August, uh, and this, this is my second year uh, in the program. And uh, currently, uh, we are running the McGill Net Impact Chapter. So this is um, uh, a member chapter of the Net Impact. Uh, global, uh, we are we are open to uh, masters uh, programs mainly in the business school uh, and undergrad uh, pr programs too. Right. Can you yeah. talk about a little bit about what net net, net impact is? Mm -hmm. What is it? Um, net impact. Uh, you actually, it's 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 a very broad idea. Anything that could impact the environment, the society, the communities included in the net in, in net impact uh, for the. 
uh, vision we had uh, was mainly to in, uh, pre- provide an environment for people who have the ideas in sustainability, in uh, bringing the community in a more collaborative uh, culture to or to uh, protect the environment. Uh, these kind of ideas that students have, we encourage them to de- develop their ideas into real uh, programs, mm-hmm. uh, either on campus or you know, in in uh, in community or or uh, just a, a company, a real yeah. company. So there is a uh, an aspect of it that is related to creating business, but there's also you said broader than that also. So it's yeah. not necessarily always about creating yeah. a for profit business. It could be about creating a different kind of organization or working yeah, with- it could uh, for non profits for, for any uh, form that you think you can bring some. Uh, benefit to people around you, to mm-hmm. the society. It's all fine. It's all welcome. Yeah. Uh, we just uh, encourage people to have that idea uh, rooted in their mind and make it come to reality. There are three. Three okay. teams from McGill, three teams from Concordia, and three, uh, two teams from HEC. Okay. So basically before... Uh, uh, I felt the different. Uh, there are different clubs or uh, student society in the in different schools, and mm-hmm. we are kind of uh, independent and uh, you know separate, uh, segmented. Right. Uh, however, sustainability is uh, it's a, it's such a broad idea, and I think it's always too beneficial for people to come together and discuss about their opinions and learn from each other. And we want to create that environment for the students. Okay. We want to share uh, the, the resources and bring the events into a bigger level. So that's why we uh, cooperate in this event. And uh, uh, basically, this, the aim of it, 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 this event uh, is to help the uh, other students who have the sustainability mindset mm-hmm. to really practice uh, developing their business ideas into the into a very structured uh, way, and then we uh, mm-hmm. give the give the chance for them to practice, and then they can uh, have a more mature model and a more and a better pitch, and then they can approach other mm-hmm. uh, organizations, other investment companies, or or some uh, adoption center. They can sell their ideas, ideas, and uh, get the real support. Right. Yeah, that's our our goal. But this, I think, it's a very beginning start. It's a starting point for them to mm-hmm. to to do that. That was Emily Mung, MBA student at McGill University. To learn more about Net Impact and to see if they have a chapter in your town, you can check in the show notes. The way the competition was structured was such that the students were meant to map out their idea using the flourishing business canvas, which if you're familiar with the business model canvas or lean startup canvas, you'll be familiar with this concept. It kind of takes the core sections of what might exist in a conventional business plan and maps them out in a 2D space. The idea is to hopefully better understand, explore, and improve the proposed solution in relation to key stakeholders and to concerns such as in social and environmental benefits. Uh, Let's listen in to this part of the day. Too, right? So what we want to do now is kind of give you a bit of an overview this is hard to do in this amount of time, so allow yourself to fumble along a bit and be confused and ask questions. This is part of the process, so this everything is perfect, okay? So let's talk now about the costs and the benefits, okay? So costs, okay, if you're involved in printing notebooks, it's the cost of the paper, right? It's the cost of giving it delivered, it's the cost of finishing the product at the end and, and cost of getting it to the market. It's a cost of marketing. It's a cost of outreach. It's a cost of your office. It's the cost of, you know, food, whatever it is that you're involved in. Like just this, this part should be easy for you guys, right? But this is not outside of the MBA. <laughs> so but this, we, yeah, go ahead. But we also realize that you, you're not going to have those numbers now. And, and so that's, that's also great. Um, it's not that you have to come up with them, but when you're using this canvas, that's what the cost box means. But there's also other costs, because you can see the environment, society, and the costs of your organization. So what are the costs of your business in environmental terms? What is the cost that you may be taking from a society perspective? So it's thinking about costs 
with all three contexts in mind. So maybe right now you can't figure out the actual costs of what your, you know what this business is going to take to run, but you can figure out whether you're going to have some carbon emissions or you know um, some impact on soil because there's a farming, you, there's a food element. So those are costs that you need to be thinking about because when you're building sustainable business models, you're also thinking about how to offset those costs. After an overview of the flourishing business canvas, including some examples, the students were asked to get to work on their own ideas. I think let's get to our canvases. You guys ready to get to work? Yes. So okay. grab some stickies, pens, and go and stand around your canvas because we, we're going to start mapping out your ideas. And, and just choose whichever canvas is So the students worked ideas. for several hours before the end of the day where they presented their business plans in front of judges. Hi, we are Patrick Money and we, and we believe in fair access to financial services to everyone. Let me tell you the story about Juan. Juan, like more than 11 million undocumented aliens in the U.S., went to that country for a dream of providing to his family back home. Now, I'm not going to play the presentations here because some of these students are actually working on these business plans. And we don't want to share their top secret information. But all this to say, this kind of process, the sustainable business competition, is sort of an entryway for a lot of students who are interested in business and management to think about making a business more sustainable. You normally get people to populate a canvas like you're doing with a new idea over two days. So this is like express version. But thank you for tackling it, and we hope that it's inspired you to think about business, its role in our world, um, and potentially your contribution that you can make as future business leaders in our world. It's not necessarily the same idea as social entrepreneurship as presented by Martin and Osberg, so we wanted to share the reflections of another person who spent quite a bit of time thinking about this. And so we spoke with this woman. My name is Daniela Poppy Thornton. I am an educator that works in systems-led leadership. So I have a background in development work uh, and social entrepreneurship. I spent six years in Cambodia running an education and youth leadership organization, education travel company. And out of the back of that work, I recognized that a lot of what was happening in volunteer travel was problem-led, not systems-led, right? How do we, you know, paint a fence, teach an English class, kind of these one-off initiatives that were sold with an idea that they were, quote-unquote, helping. Uh, but in fact, they were Band-Aids at, at best and, and sometimes causing harm because they weren't really connected to uh, communities and understanding of problems. And there was a lot of uh, issues with financial transparency, etc., then I went and I did my MBA and um, was lucky to get to work at the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at, at Oxford, um, Said Business School, and had a chance to teach at a number of universities through through that work and, and, and my work in Cambodia and recognized that in social entrepreneurship, we were kind of teaching the same thing. We were like doing hackathons and these business plan competitions that were asking people tell me how you're going to win, tell me how you're going to fix it, tell me how you're going to solve. But what they weren't saying is, tell me about the system of this problem. Tell me what's already being tried. Tell me how whatever you're about to suggest is going to connect with what's already there and hopefully unlock the potential of other nodes in the system. And so my interest and in work now is, is in teaching um, and creating educational tools to help people think in a systems-led way. Could you talk a little bit about what you mean by system and when it's broken or not? Sure. I think a lot of people that, that teach and work in systems would say a system can never be broken in the sense that it's creating the result it was designed to create in the same way we'd never say like if a cloud was raining, we're not like, oh my God, it's broken, right? It's that the weather system and we don't understand it all and we can't, we can understand some of the, you know, sometimes the weatherman gets it right, right? Because we have some understanding, but we don't understand every single thing about it. Whereas if our car breaks down and we bring it to the mechanic, that's also a system, but we don't say to them, you know, sir, I was really mean to my car last week and my husband and I were arguing and it was raining and, 
you know, we're in Taurus and Libra, whatever, you know, we like the, we're just like, no, fix the starter or whatever. Right. Cause we under that system is like, it's complete and closed and contained and it's not a complex ecological system. Right. So I think what sometimes happens is that especially in business schools, especially in like linear thinking traditions, we try and turn everything into the car, right? We're trying to turn it into this like manual that says if A plus B equals C, right? Like there's just, if something's broken, we should know how to fix it, right? And then we are starting to get these like linear thinking, traditional business model teachers and educators and, and schools that are saying, well, wow, we want to work on problems in the world. And a lot of those problems are not linear. They're, they're complex. And those systems are integrated into other systems so that we don't, we don't have complete control. They're not all contained within a nice body of a, a vehicle, right? And we're trying to use the same linear tactics of solving. We're like, it's all about scale replication and, and how, you know, A plus B equals C. Um, and I think that what my work is trying to do, and I think what a lot of people that are doing similar work are trying to do, are saying, how how do we help people understand the other pieces that are influencing whatever it is, the challenge that you're that you're looking at? So it's not broken, but you're saying there's resources that go into a system, there's results that come out, there's roles, rules, and relationships in the middle, and there's obviously some sort of result that you don't like that you're thinking should be changed, right? And that's like the five R's model. And if you look up USAID five R's, there's a whole toolkit that teaches you how to use that type of model, right? And then, but what sometimes happens is we forget, you know what, there's results of that system that are probably positive for some people. Who benefits from the system being the way it is, right? Those people might or might not want the system to change, right? So when I say system in terms of helping people think about think in use system thinking techniques and think in systems i'm i'm referring to complex social ecological systems and this concept of problems that aren't linear we asked her to tell us about a tool that she's helped to develop called the impact gap assessment tool i created that tool um in i think 2015 16 when i was writing a report called tackling heropreneurship and i was looking at this trend that a lot of students where I was working and and at a lot of the other places my colleagues were working at where students were applying saying I want to be a social entrepreneur that's like why I'm going to business school or that's why I'm taking your course or why I want to apply for your accelerator or whatever I want to be a social entrepreneur but I just need to figure out my business model and my issue right and so what that was telling me was that people were equating social entrepreneurship with like you could just like reach into a bag pick out any business model pick out an issue right and what that, what the, what I saw as real social entrepreneurship was creating really strong change was people who had deep understanding of a challenge and had deep understanding of that system. And they were kind of agnostic as to what tool they would pull out of their pocket. They would pull out the tool of advocacy or policy change or convening and connecting different organizations or working from within a current corporation or a current nonprofit and they might pull out the tool of starting a new social venture if that happened to be the tool that was needed in that particular challenge, right? And so the Impact Gaps Canvas uh, was designed to kind of counter the business plan competition mindset uh, of saying before we just jump into this like quick hackathon solution, let's first understand the problem. So that's the left side of the canvas. The canvas has, you know, left side, right side, and a middle. That's the order that you do it in. In order to bring to life these sections of the canvas as she goes through them, we're going to interlace a presentation from the 2018 Map the System competition that was held in Oxford. And we're going to share with you the winning presentation, which was by Canadian Roisin Dillon about the opioid crisis in Canada. Really ubiquitous part of what I'm seeing on a daily basis as a registered nurse. It's a public health epidemic. Recently working in emergency, I had a patient coming in with a diagnosis of seizures secondary to fentanyl overdose. That's all the information that I got to see, and I made a lot of assumptions about what that person was going to look like based on that piece of paper and the type of life that they might have had. In an excellent exercise in humility, all of my assumptions were wrong. 
Rebecca was a 17-year-old girl who had experimented with drugs for the first time, and unfortunately, her supply was laced with fentanyl. The left side is, what's the problem? What's holding it in place? What are the numbers? What's causing it? Who benefits from it staying the way it is? What's the history of it? Kind of like, what are the numbers and facts and causes and, and what's going on? This really started in the 1960s when fentanyl was synthesized. In 1996, Purdue Pharma released OxyContin. This was an immediate market success and changed our perception of pain. It was marketed as something that was less addictive and that individuals could take on a regular basis so that nobody had to live with pain anymore. This is when a pain goal of zero became a goal in society. This is not always realistic. In 2007, the same company settled for $600 million for false marketing to consumers and physicians. And in 2012, as a result, the Canadian market actually pulled this medication off of our market and replaced it with a synthetic version. This is less easy to manipulate, and as such, we really saw a rise in fentanyl to replace OxyContin. And we have had a 300% increase in opioid The scope of the problem is massive. In 2008, about 150 people in Canada died as a result of opiates, and in 2017, that number was over 4,000 people. This is a 2,600% increase in less than a decade, and primarily occurring in individuals aged 30 to 39. So this is killing really young people. And then the right side is, what's already being tried? You probably aren't the first person to recognize that this is that there's something going wrong, right? So, like, what's already been tried in the past? What's being tried now? Are most people trying solutions in urban areas and no one's doing rural areas? Are most people focused on youth but no one's looking at seniors? Are most people focusing on a certain demographic, a certain, um, you know, population of people, right? What is And what models are being tried? What are the differences between these, these different organizations that are trying things and what seems to be working what, and where and why, right? So it's kind of just what's going on in the solutions landscape. What solutions do exist? At the global level in Portugal, which was once Europe's worst country for drug-related deaths, as a result, they've actually decriminalized all drugs. This is not the same thing as legalization, so an individual who is caught with less than a 10-day supply is put in front of a healthcare body instead of a court of law. That healthcare body acts as a publicly funded central agency, which umbrellas all of the services available to that person and decides the best ones for them at that time. These include things like mobile methadone clinics, as well as job trading for those people to really integrate back into their communities, and has resulted in a 50% reduction in death rates in Portugal and what resources might be brought to bear that don't currently consider themselves part of the quote-unquote solutions landscape, but that like, might be useful in trying to, uh, to shift this, this problem. Um, and then the, the gap in the middle is basically saying, if I look at the left and I look at the right, what's missing? So, okay, if I looked on the right, I looked at, at different countries in the world or different towns or different places that have tried to solve similar problems, I might say, wow, other people have tried policy change in this way or that way and we haven't yet. Or other people seem to have used these collective impact methods that are using these longer term views and, and long term convening and maybe that's missing. Or some people, you know, there's, there seems to be a, a gap in this demographic or in this type of model where no one's, you know, doing that. The gaps and levers of change that I identified throughout my research, within nonprofit organizations, there's a lack of cross-sectoral collaboration. They need to use their expertise to lobby across sectors and create partnerships. Within healthcare, there's a lack of comprehensive treatment programs. We blanket all addiction as the same when it's not. So we need to create those partnerships and educate and train staff as well to question their own assumptions like I made about Rebecca. We have a lack of education and support within communities, so we need to educate communities, especially those that may be disproportionately affected, and meaningfully include them in the conversation that creates the solution. Within governments, I mentioned cyclical leadership, which creates a lack of continuity. We have no policies that maintain themselves past the governments that create them. So we need to be able to upscale those policies and educate across sectors. Pharmaceutical companies have a lack of transparency. So the pharmaceutical companies that create fentanyl are also the ones that create Narcan, its antidote. This is a massive conflict of interest and shows no internal regulation. This is an opportunity for governments and pharmaceutical companies to work together to be at the forefront of the solution rather than contribute to the problem. And lastly, misconceptions. 
may not intuitively seem like a gap. However, the assumptions and the misconceptions we make about people who are struggling with this as a problem really, really leverage our ability to engage with them at a social level. So we need mental health programming that deals with the cause of this problem in the first place, health promotion and prevention programs. And so the idea would be that if a student or anyone uses this canvas, at the end, they, they, you shouldn't be able to say, I looked at the problem, I looked at the landscape of current solution, and the only thing is missing is my idea for this app. You know, it, it should be that you walk away with an identification of multiple gaps. And then if you want to use more like traditional systems tools, you can look at different levers of change and, and, and you could look at a lot of Donella Meadows work and say like which levers might um, have a high, you know higher impact in shifting this. But, but that's in some ways to me even beyond what's necessary of just shifting the initial thinking mindset, which is instead of jumping in to figure out how to make my app successful and prove how my app is going to make a lot of money, my first job is to understand the problem, what's already being tried, and, and what might be missing. And, and maybe that helps me understand that my app might be a good idea, but it maybe helps me understand that it might not be. And if it is a st still a good idea, then it might help me understand how my app might connect to the things that are already there, how I might learn from and build upon that, the current efforts, how it might be you know, integrated into existing in efforts. So you, you, I guess the idea is that you, somebody would start off with kind of a, a problem uh, that, they, that they want to address, that they have a passion to address, and they would try to kind of really find a, a strong, or they would try to understand it very deeply, right? Not on a very superficial level. And then when they're kind of mapping the system, and this is where I, I guess uh, I, I'm hoping you can kind of clarify this for me, is to look at like not just, you know, business, what are businesses doing, but to also look at, you know, what is the nonprofit sector doing? What is government doing? Um, what is kind of like the local context, they'll kind of take into account all those things when they're they're mapping the system, right? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of times that's, I think, what, what goes missing in business schools is this idea that government is, you know, a key actor here, right? And if we overlook them and just try and bypass them, we're never going to be able to, to really find um, ways to shift things at scale, right? So what is government doing? Is, you know, what... What opportunities are there for government to be doing stuff that that aren't being done? You know, so that and there's usually a lot more happening than than we initially think, uh, especially if we just look only at social ventures or we look just at nonprofits, right? We like what are existing um, corporates, what are existing government entities, what are existing efforts look like, and what you know what's happening there. I was wondering if you could just define the term heropreneurship. Sure. Um, so I kind of use it as a tongue in cheek in a negative way. I think that, you know, different people uh, have used the term to positively uh, describe entrepreneurs as heroes. Um, and I, when I say tackling heropreneurship, I'm, I'm basically saying, let's tackle this mindset movement and celebration of the entrepreneur as hero, not because there can't be entrepreneurial heroes, but because the ability to create change is much wider than than just founders of of uh, new ventures, right? So, what I the way I view this is that if I have a class of forty students, maybe one of them is gonna be a social entrepreneur, right? Maybe one in 10 classes is going to be a quote-unquote systems entrepreneur, which is a new term that people are using to describe people that maybe 20 years ago when the term social entrepreneurship was first starting, people would have described as social entrepreneurs. But basically people that are using entrepreneurial tactics with a very systems-led way, um, that's, that takes long-term commitment and understanding, right? And so my, my thoughts are like, how do I help all 40 of those students? So instead of teaching to the one how do I tell all 40 of those students understand that they that the work happens in systems, understand how they might be able to contribute from whatever role they find themselves in 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 their future careers in terms of positively contributing to change in the systems th that they care about. Um, 
and how do we move away from this like hierarchy of thinking that the hero entrepreneur is like the best job, right? Because it's not the right fit for everybody. And we don't want everyone to grab a flag and hike, a, hike up a hill and say, follow me, I'm, I'm the leader, right? Like we need people to fix the things that already exist. And that is not as sexy and new and innovative and fun as like a business plan pitch competition where you're starting something new. <laughs> okay. Well, would you be able to give us an example of um, maybe uh, a person that you've worked with or an organization, or some uh, an example where you've seen somebody move from this um, solutions uh, focus towards more of a systems change mindset in, for example, uh, creating a business or organization. Do you have an example of this? Sure. I can give you a, a few different things. So first, let me share, and I think obviously you guys know this, that we, we turned that uh, Impact Gaps Canvas into a competition, which is like trying to tackle business plan competitions, trying to be the like a, an alternative to those. And it's called Map the System, and the McConnell Foundation funds it across Canada. Um, and so that competition, instead of a business plan competition where you pitch your idea and you win because you have the most innovative solution, you're pitching your understanding of the problem, your understanding of what's already being tried, and your understanding of the different gaps, right? Um, so I have a few examples. We have a, a, a student group that had already gone through an entire entrepreneurship course, and that course was designed to have them jump in, pitch a business, right? And they had, it was about tomato canning in Sierra Leone. None of them were from Sierra Leone, but they had interests in like organic food and food waste preservation and, and Africa. But um, so they... Uh, they had gone through that entire class. They'd pitched their their business model idea. They'd actually traveled to the area. Then they entered Map the System, and they they had to you know take a, a more thirty thousand foot view of the of the challenge rather than get into the nitty gritty of of you know what their website was going to look like and what their canning machines were going to cost, right? And this was like what's really happening? What's the problem? And so they they started to recognize that there was like issues, a lot of the issues had to do with transportation and roads and like things that, that weren't factored into their initial business model, right? And they started to look at how have other people dealt with other, um, you know, food waste issues in, in tangential countries, right? And so they, they, at the end of that, they really felt like, gosh, we have such a deeper understanding of this problem and and it's more complex than we thought right and so then i think one of them went on to do a research project so it it, it doesn't always necessarily lead itself to you know business plan competition leads itself if you win you you take money and then you try out what you just said right uh, with this competition it's more like oh now i want some money that maybe i can go get an internship with one of these people that i think's doing something really interesting right we had a woman that was she's from hawaii and she was really interested in cultural preservation with economic empowerment of indigenous communities, right? So she was interested in that for native Hawaiians, but she knew that there was some really interesting work going on in New Zealand with Maori led organizations. And so she did a great research project learning about this issue. And then she took the money that she wanted to go do a six month, uh, internship at two different places in New Zealand to understand how they work so that she could bring that knowledge back to communities in Hawaii, right? So those are kind of like from the student perspective. Um, somebody who I think is really systems led in their work at, at kind of a professional level, um, Baljeet Sandhu <coughs> wrote a great report <coughs> called um, The Value of Lived Expertise. She uh, was uh, an award-winning child's rights lawyer in the UK, um, and, and was, had recognized that a lot of the leaders that she thought were doing really incredible work in the social sector had lived expertise in the area that they were working in. But yet, like, you know, if you were homeless, we don't usually put that on our CV, was homeless, right? You're putting, like, went to this school, took that class, did this thing, right? But actually, if you're working on the issue of homelessness, the fact that you were homeless is an expertise, an asset, and a strength, and a skill that will allow you to have a different view of that system 
than anyone who is just looking at it from the outside, right? And and what she found was that these were these were like kind of hidden expertises that that some people weren't even like sharing, that others didn't know that they had lived expertise in these issues. So it's a great report that she wrote. But she's done she's created a number of initiatives, um, and one I think is 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 pretty incredible. It's called the Twenty Twenty Seven Project in the UK. They've started in twenty seventeen. It's a ten year project, a million pounds a year, and the idea is that. In the philanthropic world, in foundations, we know from studying this that we invest in people like us, that look like us, or that speak our language, or have our same grammar, or just are in our networks, right? And so what they what they found was that if you could have lived expertise grant makers, you're going to then expand and hopefully be able to then invest in more people with life, lived expertise. And so for the million pounds a year, they're training up 10 lived experience grant makers and they already have uh, dozens and dozens of UK foundations that have already raised their hand to say they'd love to hire someone who has who is you know a proven track record in the nonprofit sector already but who also happens to have lived expertise in the area of which they're making grants and so they're good so I mean that's one of her many initiatives that I feel like where she looks at the system and says She's not just stamping her feet and saying, gosh, we are undervaluing lived expertise. She's like, how do we shift this? And she's taking a really systems view of initiatives that might might make the shift. She explained to us how her thinking about the canvas has changed in the few years since it's been initially published. The piece that's really missing in my discussions of that initially, um, and I think the piece that's really important when we talk about this with students, is, is power, right? Like who has power in relation to... Um, solving or contributing the, the most power in terms of maybe ameliorating a, a problem that you see, and then who is the most impacted by it, right? And the areas where those think where there's a disconnect, where the people who are most impacted by it have the least power, right? There's opportunities there for entrepreneurial thinking, not necessarily new startups, but new initiatives, new ways of working, behavior change models. You know, I mean, there's or new policy, whatever, you, it depends on the issue, but to rethink how do we give power and voice and leadership back how do, you know, from, from the, back to the people that, whose lives are most impacted by this. And I, and I think that, um, especially in, in today's day and age, we're talking a lot about power and privilege, race. These issues need to be at the forefront of our conversations in our classes. And I think as educators, especially educators working in business schools who are used to teaching business models and things like that, it, those seem like really scary topics and they're topics that we aren't usually necessarily um, talking about day to day. And so sometimes it means we need to get more training on how to do that. And we need to, um, you know, you know, really, really think about the, the values of those conversations in our classrooms. But if we don't bring those in, we're, we're creating you know, my joke is always students win these business plan competitions with an app for Nigerian farmers. They've never farmed. They've never been to Nigeria. We give them a whole bunch of money. They fly. They meet some farmers. They realize that their idea wasn't grounded in the first place. They get credit. They get their flights covered. They've now taken a lot of people's time who do have lived expertise on an issue and who are experts on a problem. And we've, we've like perpetrated broken power dynamics and never brought them to light in our students thinking and that's where we're failing as educators so i think that that as educators we have an opportunity or responsibility um to really rethink the way that 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 we teach social innovation work That was Daniela Pappy Thornton. You can find her contact information in the show notes. So it would seem on the whole that a lot of people have been described as social entrepreneurs who might be better named entrepreneurs with a social or environmental mission. That's not to say that these companies are not doing good work, but rather the boundaries that encompass the notion put forth by Martin and Osberg, as well as the systems change approach, doesn't necessarily fit with a lot of consumer-oriented companies that we've come to label as social or sustainable businesses. As these are companies that are mostly working within an existing system and are seeking to make it better, in the way that a lot of social service providers do. Then again, as Martin and Osberg asserted, there is something of a gray zone when we move from theory to practice. We'll leave 
with a few thoughts from Martin and Osberg. If, if, if you want, there's one, there's one more thing that, I, that at least uh, struck me as really interesting as we got into the social entrepreneurs uh, more, and that is the degree to which they have to balance a set of tensions. The social great social entrepreneurs have to, at the same time, abhor the current equilibrium, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be motivated to do anything. If they like the current equilibrium, they'd say, why do I want to change it? Uh, but at the same time, it's abhorring that they have to appreciate it enough to understand kind of why it's the way it is. And they have to balance the, the notion that they're an expert, but they're also an apprentice, right? So they bring some expertise to bear, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do anything particularly useful, but they also have to apprentice and really learn and understand the system they're, they're working on as if they're an apprentice. Uh, and then they have to, uh, have to be able to both experiment and commit. Right? So most of the social entrepreneurs that we, that we study didn't sort of come up with the all singing, all dancing idea day one. Uh, uh, but at some point they committed to something enough that they could really, that they could really drive it. And so I, I came away, I've come away from now studying them saying they really walk this incredibly fine line between different sides of the, of the, of the tension. And so if they just are, I abhor this, I'm a super expert and I know the answer chances are they're not going to be a successful social entrepreneur. Even though you might say, that's very leaderly. You hate this terrible situation and you're, you're really smart and, and you're really committed to an answer, but probably it won't be an answer that drives equilibrium uh, change. If whatever system we're working on, whether it's water and sanitation, whether it's education, whether it's deforestation, if we can look at those trends and see that they're heading in the right direction. That's a high bar, and yet that's the bar we think that social entrepreneurship has to sustain. So let us know what you think. You can reach us on various social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Medium. And please share your thoughts with us. We're eager to hear from you guys. You can subscribe to The Worlds We Want and never miss an episode. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, and all the other platforms you can find your free podcasts. Tell your friends. And also, please leave us a review if you like the show so other people like you can find us. Thanks for all the support we've received so far. We really appreciate it. Thanks to our guests and to the Sustainable Business Plan Competition for allowing us to be a fly on the wall during the day of their event. Writing and editing by Cheryl Gladu. Music featured in this episode is Are You Well? by Best Fern. It's not that easy being green Having to spend each day the color of the leaves When I think it could be nicer Being red or yellow or gold Or something much more colorful like that <laughs> Why put it so simply? <laughs> Why be so direct?